Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So earlier today, I met a gentleman who was telling me that the problem with the media is that it's not self-reflective. It's not looking within. And I'm really hoping that through this session, we are able to kind of take a look within and sort of come up with some answers, look at the challenges that we are facing in these changing times, um, and look at solutions maybe. So I'm really looking forward to talking to each one of you. Um, we are, uh, in the introduction, Mr. Smith did mention that we want to look at how the technologies are changing the core value of journalism. So my first question is to uh, Rinal. I want to understand from you what are the core values of journalism? What are the values of journalism that we are still abiding by, given that there has been a drastic transition I mean, I come from digital, you are from print. How do you see, uh, how do you see these core values changing, if at all? I think the core value remains the same, to tell the truth as we see it. And I emphasize we, because there is no objective truth. It has to be subjective. If we pick up a subject, we take a stand. We are taking a stand, whether we acknowledge it or not. So that being the core value, I think we should be questioned on whether or not we are able to present facts as we see them. Are we doctoring them? Are we hiding something? Are we leaving something unsaid? Are we rearranging facts? These are the questions that need to be asked. And I think no matter what the media, whether it's print or whether it is uh, the digital media or whatever the media is coming in future, this will remain the core question. Are we giving people the news for which we are known? And as for your first assertion, what somebody told you about media looking within, I think we, are, we in the media are constantly being blamed, though we are more victims. Uh, than perpetrators uh, and therefore I think that also needs to be looked at. Thank you. Great. Avinash, would you also like to react to this um, given your expertise in TV news? So uh, first of all, I, I agree with uh, Milan ma'am that look, there is, uh, its medium has changed of communication but does not mean that the subject matter has changed. We are remain at the core of what we do is to report uh, and speak true to the power, right? And uh, uh, so in today's time, uh, everybody is an expert on media. There was a time when I visited the city and I used to tell them that I work for a TV channel 24-7. They used to call me and talk to me and talk to me with respect. <laughs> Unfortunately, the last one is not anymore <coughs> with our profession and the people who have brought it down is us, not anybody else. Okay. If we continue to do our job honestly, diligently and every day, I don't think so whether it is a television, digital, print and even pamphleteering, nothing is going to change the core of what we do is a good journalistic job. You used the word respect there is another word which kind of comes up a lot, which is trust. Um, Anjan, if you would like to answer this for me. Um, I mean, we all can smile and laugh about, uh, you know, losing respect, but it kind of also hurts because uh, there was a time when journalists were looked up with a lot of reverence. In these changing, polarizing, if I may say, times, uh, there has been a shift in how even the journalists are looked at. Uh, can you tell me what can be done better, uh, probably specifically talking about India, when it comes to regaining the news trust and also the respect of the viewers and readers? Sure. Thanks, Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I agree with uh, what Nirana Avinash just said uh, about and your, to your question, you know, the media has historically not uh, been self-reflective. When I began to be a journalist, I wrote a piece, I wrote one piece uh, 10 years ago that, was, that criticized the media. And I got calls from my friends telling me, you know, there's an unwritten rule in the media that journalists don't criticize each other. 
and apparently nobody told you this. <laughs> and so it was a, you know, a rookie mistake in their eyes. But I think, you know, to your question, and to what Rinalji just said, um, there is a subjectivity to news production and news reporting that we should be more transparent about because readers and viewers are more and more aware, increasingly aware of what we're not saying, of which side we're on. And I think the more transparent we are about uh, what position we're coming from, how we're holding power accountable, uh, and what blind spots we may have, to be transparent to the, to the uh, yeah. audience, I think that will engender trust where you know, they say, okay, we're gonna listen to you. We also understand that you have been open about what you may not be good at. Okay, uh, I want to go to um, Anuradha. You are an expert when it comes to Assam. If you can maybe touch upon, uh, say, you know, news from the region, northeastern region itself, and talk about a bit about the importance yeah. and uh, why that regional news often gets neglected and what can be done better to bring up the standards. Yeah, definitely. Mm, uh I agree with all that uh, core value is the same. It is nothing matters that whether it is a regional news or a national news, news value is the same. If you, if you want to cover, uh, then uh, it could be a very valuable news. If you don't want to cover the regional news, that is, it is nothing. Okay, sometimes I feel that, uh, that regional uh, uh, news uh, becomes hyper-local sometimes because it has to be. Sometimes we have uh, seen that uh, some core problem has been not covered by the national media. Uh, and uh, in the uh, scenario from the Assam also, I have seen many things that, uh, okay, uh, after the technology's advancement, uh, there is a, the value system is the same, yeah. but pressure uh, on TRP, and you know uh, the circulation and earning advertisement. This business motives has rise day, day by day. Yeah. Okay. And uh, earlier, when we joined uh, in the regional media before 20 years, so I have seen that uh, it was mere service. It, it was not a total business. You know. Nowadays, actually, the time is changing and everything is changing. So that uh, we are now realized, at that time, actually, being an editor, I realized that that, that time, it was not a white-collar job. Uh, we used to visit, uh, we used to visit some disputed area, the, you know, where the milit militant disturbance were there. We just, uh, we have visited there. We used to vis visit there, and we just interact with the people to people, heart to heart. This, uh, this whole, you know, the whole style of uh, their working, that was different. And nowadays, it's just very much comfortable with the technology and all, sitting yeah. in a newsroom. And sometimes uh, uh, some uh, news has been uh, not covered properly. So that uh, I think the regional media is very important for us in everywhere, in every state. Yeah. And there is no, actually, the regional and Indian media difference because I think there's only the language is difference because we write in, from the Assam, I write in Assam, Assamese, and this is a newspaper, uh, we, it is a vernacular Assamese newspaper. If you go to the Gujarat, the Gujarati newspaper, okay? The, only the language stands for the, you know, regional, but... Yeah. I think there is yeah. no difference. Uh, please, uh, there is no difference. Yes. Sir. You know, uh, I just want to point out uh, the elephants in the room. There are several of them. The first elephant is the ownership of the media. Yes. Yeah, that's you true. Know, um, you, the the owners. Um, when I started way back before most of you were born, uh, the owners, they used to be family-owned groups, at least in Indian languages. 
and I have worked in Hindi, which covers, which has a very large footprint. It covers 11 states, and 11 states have 11 different kinds of Hindi. So, uh, if you bring out a Hindi newspaper and you bring out supplements, then you need a separate supplement for each state because their Hindi is different from the neighboring state. So the ownership question is important because in Hindi it has never been professionally addressed, the question of putting together an editorial team. It is mostly, I'm very ashamed to say, based on who you know and who you trust. And there was also, many years ago, the caste question. You know, are you upper caste? Even today, most of the vernacular language editors, at least, belong to the upper castes. And that is a major elephant in the room because it somehow blocks many vital questions about two-thirds of our people, even in each region, from surfacing as powerful questions of today. The second elephant in Rome are the intermediaries. Till 2019, they were called intermediaries as platforms. You know, they were just aggregators of news. And so, while the print media and the news channels were subjected to laws curbing dissemination of information or uh, speaking in favor of certain political parties after the elections uh, were de declared, uh, this did not apply to the intermediaries. So intermediaries became a kind of a bargain basement for various political parties. And here, um, again, CD fact is that nationally somehow English has always been the language of the movers and shakers, or it has been considered to be so. But the language of the voters uh, are diverse vernaculars. So the parties which caught on to this fact immediately spread out within the Hindi and all other regional medias, and also began pressurizing the owners. Either they bought up the owners, and mega companies arose, or they pressurized them politically because a lot of them had businesses other than journalism. And thus, pressure groups began to be uh, exerting pressures on the journalists. And one thing I must point out before I close is, most of the vernacular journalists come from very poor families. They have rural backgrounds, or if they are urban families, they have lower middle class backgrounds. All my life, I've seen how they have struggled to get where they are. And they are deadly scared of losing their job. Very often, they are the only earning member in the family. And this fact was cruelly realized by political parties who asked the owners to twist their arm. And that is why, at the moment, I think a recent report uh, that has come out says that misinformation and disinformation, we top the list. and. Of the misinformed people, almost 65% are vernacular readers. So I would like to have. I would stuff. love for us to talk a bit more about misinformation, disinformation. But Avinash, if you can talk, a, like talk about ownership and what it is doing to, you know, plurality and representation, and uh, well, I can freedom. speak on that subject all through the day. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is, topic is very dear to my heart. Look, I believe in capitalism. I think capitalism solves most of the life's problem much better way than any other social system can do. And so the, the, there should be a free ownership. And I uh, somehow, while I relate with what Minalji is saying and what Ma'am just said, but I, but I don't think that the state in any way or, or, or society in any way should interfere in the free flow of capital into the media companies. Okay? Whosoever wants to own whichever media, they are free to own. The problem is not about just the ownership itself. Okay. The problem is about the structure of the businesses. Currently, you have how many people in this room will pay 25 rupees for a newspaper? 25 rupees for a newspaper is the price in Pakistan. And people buy it. In India, the maximum price that we put a, on, a, on a newspaper is 10 rupees, 7 rupees. News channels are free. 
120 rupees you give to cable operator, you get 300 channels free. Peep, and you want to watch all the time on the Facebook timeline and on your YouTube, all the news items. You don't want to pay. So then where's the money coming from? Money is coming from my friends who are sitting, uh, leading advertising industry people sitting in this room. They are the one who are looking at eyeballs. They are not looking at any involved eyeballs, which was earlier the way to sell media businesses. Because you were telling them that, look, people are engrossed in reading an article, which Minaraji has written, and on the bottom of that, we'll put your ad. So your ad will get the similar degree of attention that an article has got. Unlike today, in the current technical age, where the distribution mechanism has gone completely out of your hand from the media owners, it is in the big tech platforms that they are distributing the content. They will decide what you are going to see, watch, and read. The model of monetizing good content has gone out of your hand. Unless you don't solve that structural issue, media companies will be not be free because they'll be dependent on advertising. Advertising comes through going mass, not about, not about the customer segregation that we do in all businesses. We are not able to do that. You work for Quint. It's, it's meant for a very selected consumer uh, who is interested in those kind of news. But to market that, you are dependent on today on Google and Facebook. Who will decide who is going to read and for how long? I wouldn't directly respond to that, but I do want to take this conversation forward. Uh, thank you so much for that input. Uh, we spoke about misinformation and disinformation. I want to segue a little and actually come to the barrage of technologies that we have promised to our audience. Um, with AI coming in in a pretty big way with OpenAI, uh, launched November 2022, if I'm not wrong. Uh, where do you see uh, it going from here? We have seen it evolve in the last couple of months, more than a year now. Where do you see this is going to, how is it going to disrupt the media companies all across the world? Sure, that's a big question, but uh, <laughs> I guess what I would point out is Minaji spoke about regulations of you know, these uh, media companies, and I mean, as you spoke about the digital space, cyberspace, and I think the trend that I see is that it's going to be harder and harder to regulate these companies, harder to, uh, you know, the, the impose or protect the old values of journalism, because in cyberspace, or cyberspace, the internet, is dominated by private companies. Yes. Private companies have more power than governments. In fact, it's private companies that drive regulation or deregulation, they drive the agenda. And uh, they own the data, unlike in the physical world where the government has our you know, passport, Aadhaar card, and that kind of information. In, on the internet, it's the private companies that own that data, and that, that gives them enormous power. And I think as the world becomes more and more, more virtual, as AI you know, uh, takes hold, I think it's gonna be harder to protect the old values uh, of, uh, th th that have guided the media so far. Okay. Uh, would anyone else like to respond to this on uh, where are we headed to with AI coming in and the misinformation disinformation report that you quoted from WEF? Well, I'm past the generation which will be actually dealing head on with AI. But the question that has been bothering me is how do you control a thinking machine? I've seen changes in technology when we moved from one kind of machinery to computerization and then on to the digital media. I remember the days when we faced the unions going on strike the moment they heard 500 computers had been delivered at the house and everybody was going to have to learn how to use them. But they were kind of objective things, they were tools of the trade. So after a short period of resistance, everybody gave in and then they said, what were we doing before computers yeah. came? But how do you control a thinking machine which will tell you what the day's headlines are going to be? Who are the aggregators? Who are the people who are creating the algorithms which are feeding into this? What algorithms are carrying to us? I mean, they are telling me that you are wearing a red sari. So I'll say, no, I'm wearing a green sari. The algorithm will say, no, get your eyes tested. You are way past your good <coughs> eye period. And after a long while, I will probably go to my uh, optometrist and ask him to double check my eyes. So it's going to be as confusing and as 
frightening as that. And add to this already confusing thing the fact that the government has lately decided to create legal, uh, illegal uh, networks to control all the news that goes online. Now, who's going to control thinking machines and how? Already three or four groups of journalists have taken the matter to court. There was a hung verdict with one judge agreeing with the litigants and the other judge saying, government's truth is the best truth. So that's where I leave the matter. I mean, I don't need to <laughs> speak anymore on this without and really being facing problems. <laughs> More than no, I no, already uh, am. We are, we are, Minalji, we are talking about media freedom. So, uh, so uh, look, AI is a problem as, it, as we know of it today. Okay? If it is not regulated on time and well, what has happened in the society since 2007 and 8 onwards when the social media came, AI is going to quadruple it, multiply and things will happen which we can't even think of. Uh, I'm just giving an example how the algorithm of selling more ads has led to content biases and completely darking out one side of the opinion. Uh, AI is now curating content in most of the newsroom in the digital business. AI, today I don't need an anchor to read my news. Okay. AI is curating not only news, what AI is reading, but she is also putting all the ticker at the bottom. It's all done by. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. They. She, he, anchor. So, I mean, whosoever is the anchor, right? Most of the AI anchors that we have created are women. So, you know, so in television industry. Why? Yeah, I, I mean. Now that I, we are talking I do about not it, know, why? But uh, that's how the. How, that's how the the TRPs work? I do not know Profit, because the, right? the, the, the AI anchors are not seen on television. They are seen mostly on digital. So it's not TRP. Okay. It's about, uh, so yeah, there is, a, there is a gender bias there. I agree with ma'am. So, but I'm saying that, look, this is a very dangerous situation we are in and the, the government of India is rightly trying to regulate it. Uh, I don't agree with the regulation of all online content in all forms and uh, the f fact checking by the, the government but uh, uh, but regulation of ai is is very very important it's the arbitrary nature of some of the things which is worrisome uh, but anyway i will move on to my next question which is to anuradha i want to understand uh, uh, when one we are thing, uh, yes. uh, uh, regarding misinformation and disinformation i have a interesting experience in the last month that I have been awarded uh, for an award by Sahitya Academy uh, 2021. That was the name. My, uh, there is a forest here. Okay. In a meeting in the new generation anchor, she uh, introduced me like that in Assam, in Guwahati, you know. Uh, she just introduced me as like a, here, uh, our author of. Uh, uh, here is a, here, uh, there is a river here. Uh, she is the Academy Awardee. Uh, so meet her. So I told her, this, my, my book's name is not like that. My book is not. Here is a forest here. <laughs> How it's come the river? I said, no, no, ma'am. I have read in the Google. So it is mentioned like that. So you imagine, in, the, in my own state, yeah. in my own state, uh, you know, uh, city. It is described like that, you know. <laughs> I want to ask you, in addition to sharing such a great anecdote, I want to understand from you, you know, like for example, Manipur has, uh, has been on the boil since 3rd of May last year. Mm -hmm. uh, the news from Manipur has been disproportionate and I feel a lot of digital media is yeah. filling in yeah, the gap willingly they, right there. Uh, yeah. uh, right avoided, so. avoided the... Um, <laughs> But, you know, when we are so search-driven, and this is something that I also want to understand from Anjan, when we are so search-driven, when we are letting algorithms decide the kind of stories that we do, as commissioning editors, or how can newsrooms do better to 
then be able to commission some of those stories and not be guided by keywords. I don't know if you fully understand where I'm getting to, yeah. but I want you to, I, like, does it make the problem of disproportionate news yeah. coming out from smaller places uh, much bigger than what it is right now? Yeah, because yeah. we are increasingly becoming more and more, so to say, slaves to algorithms. So, well, uh, you have told about the Manipur incident, but um, in Assam also, there is a big problem that is a flood and erosion problem. Yeah. So, have you seen any headline in the national media in the, in the, uh, when uh, Brahmaputra River and other tributaries makes always havoc uh, in every year? And from 1952 till now, there's every year the state has lost beyond 200 crores, 4 lakhs hectares land erosion. Many families, thousand families been till now, they are living in a highland or in an open air with a just, just to cover a plastic chali in the, uh, as a roof. And till they're having the refugee khanas, refugee foods and all. But these are not covered, yeah. you know? Uh, and what I, we have done in the Manipur incident time, uh, I'm running a uh, literary magazine which is under UGC care. So here I invited some poet, some theater personalities to write on it from Manipur. And they have written column and so many touching poetries to where they express their all thoughts, you know. Even, even their column, they express everything, what is exactly going on. Those are the humanitarian stories, you know. So I have the capacity because I'm an editor of a literary magazine. That's why I invited them. That you just write down the, the, of your own story. Actually, what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, after that, actually, uh, some uh, magazines, uh, English magazines, they contact to me, and they translated some poems. In yeah. Uh, that's uh, the, I think uh, this is the. Uh, actual job of a journalist, you know? Uh, so they translated four to five poems, and it is translated, um, it is translated from Assamese to English. It is by Am Kiran. Okay. He is a Academy Award poet, yeah. Okay. Um, Anjan, would you like to uh, answer the question about how do we continue to commission stories which are important, which need to come out in the public, uh, but we are sort of getting, you know, we are becoming slaves to algorithms and also at the same time, I mean, just thinking about Manipur, the amount of money that, a, say, a small digital media has to spend, it's sometimes not easy and sometimes you have to take those tough calls where you put you know, put people in situations which are risky, but you take those calls because you have limited means, limited resources, and since you have done some reporting, uh, if you can talk a bit about that as well. Sure, Anuradhaji spoke about uh, how uh, hyper-local news, uh, or the news becoming more and more hyper-localized in, you know, certain marginalized, far from the center areas of the country, and especially in the local languages. I think this key word, based approach to journalism uh, creates a lot of news deserts mm. and creates a lot of uh, areas where these hyper-local stories are not covered in the national or international media sort of uh, discourse and it creates an opportunity in that way. So I'll give an example, I'm now reporting in Mexico, I'm reporting on indigenous communities uh, fighting cartels. Uh, organized crime to protect their ecosystems. 
Now, many of these communities are extremely poor, very marginalized, and uh, they're indigenous, so there's a degree of racism. And, but there, many of them that I've traveled to are fighting incredible wars. They're incredibly brave communities. They're fighting drone wars against cartels. Huge wars to protect a mountain, a river, a forest. And given the current context of climate change, uh, or you know, the, the uh, prioritization of climate change worldwide, you would think that these communities were better covered, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And so that creates opportunities, I think, for freelance reporters who can set their own agenda, who are not driven by the algorithms, uh, and I think that, that we'll see that as an increasing trend. Unfortunately, financially, it's become more and more difficult for freelance journalists to sustain themselves. But I think more and more we're going to see freelance journalism uh, become more important to bring those hyper-local stories, which seem hyper-local, but they're actually of global importance. Yes. And, uh, and, and the news media as it's currently constructed doesn't quite capture that. I mean, it's also happening nationally where a lot of freelancers from you know, they do approach national media houses and that's how we are able to bring some of those stories as well. Uh, we have 10 minutes before we have to wind up the session. If it's okay with the panelists, I think we should just take some questions from the audience. Um, can we start with that lady in the white top, please? If someone can, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, please thank go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is open to the entire panel, so anyone is free to answer. So, uh, like Rinal Ma'am quoted, India ranked number one in the global disinformation rankings. So, in that context, I think it becomes uh, quintessential to realize that um, it is not just the present of journalism that is at threat right now. It is also young minds that are getting this warped vision of what is truth in our nation and that is creating future journalists who are just going to spread that misinformation. So my question as an upcoming journalist, as a journalist student is how do we cope with this disheartening reality that journalism is just not being honest? I'll just add to uh, the question that you asked. Thank you so much for asking that. A lot of organizations have pretty robust fact check units and uh, I mean not fact checks from the olden days of print but fact checks where we are actively debunking uh, fake news, we are sort of trying to uh, address any kind of false narratives, misinformation, disinformation. To your question, I'm just adding mine, how much will that make a difference to solve, I mean solve is a pretty big and serious word, but to address the issue of uh, disinformation and misinformation. I, I can just quickly say yes. that I, I just, uh, I'd love to hear what the other panelists think, but I, I think the big problem with fact checking is that you can't fact check what is omitted, what people aren't saying, and I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest problems with disinformation, they, they, they omit one side of the story, important yeah. facts, and uh, and so, yeah, you get only one side of the story. So having more fact checkers to tell you the truth is not going to fix that. Okay. Well, I think there's also an ancillary question, uh, that of liability. Who is liable for serving misinformation or disinformation? Disinformation is intentional. Misinformation is information, little hutke. Yeah. So <laughs> there is some degree of difference, but uh, who's liable? Now, according to the draft that has been circulated by the government, uh, the pers the, uh, apart from the person whose story it is, um, it is the editorial, is it also the platform from which they have taken the aggregated story? Are the agencies also liable? Because usually, you know, every newspaper and every channel has shrunken their human resources and they are picking more and more stories from agencies and from these big ticket platforms. Now, big ticket platforms got away easily in 2019 before the elections, saying that they were only platforms they were serving, they were not liable for what they were serving. But then, today the situation is different. It has now assumed proportions. 
in which those so-called intermediaries are also part of the total editorial output that goes into any media. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that case, if a case, government brings a case, who does the government bring the case against? Uh, all the usual culprits, of course, are there, but the sources of news and the base of aggregation and the aggregating mechanism have changed. So will old-style laws be able to cope no. with that? I'll quickly make two points. Uh, number one, I don't think fact-checking alone will solve this problem. Fact-checking is necessary. Just running the newsroom with basic discipline of verifying your sources and trusting on the primary source before you give the news, I think most of the problem will solve. And second thing that what all of us have to do is to think before you forward. We are the yeah. one who is spreading fake news. It's not the one who has created it. I'll give you an example. How many of you followed the story that all the television channels were running that Dawood Ibrahim is dead? It was not only the breaking news that Dawood Ibrahim is dead, they were following the story saying that Karachi there is a curfew. The internet has been clamped down, there is a ban on social media, while that day in Karachi because of Imran Khan's rally, they were clamping down not because of Dawood Ibrahim was dead. Uh, it has, to, it, has, it has to take Chota Shakil, the another underworld dawn, to go on television channel to tell people what rubbish you guys are spreading. Right? And who was the source of that fake news? This happens every few months. Yeah. Indian media loves to declare Dawood Ibrahim dead every few months. <laughs> but the source of that fake news was a fake ID yes. of the Pakistan's foreign minister. Now anybody with a common sense will look at that ID and say it's a parody. It's not an ID. It's not a Twitter handle. And from there, the news became in, in public domain, all newspapers, TV channels are carrying. So I think to your second point, I think it becomes very important that there is some amount of media literacy that is happening. People are kind of putting check to their biases to be able to consume news in a meaningful way. Okay, I, uh, I, can I go to the guy third from right, left, whatever, yeah. Namaste, I'm Nidhish Goyal from Jumbo Talks. My uh, question panel is so hey, that who will decide that this is disinformation or misinformation? Because many times it is a uh, data comes later, but perception firstly. If uh, Siddharth Varad Rajan or Muhammad Zubair ka narrative set hota hai, then this is information. Or if your narrative set nahi hota hai, it can be disinformation or misinformation. Many people were saying that Ram, before Ram Mandir built, there must be a world-class hospital or the world-class university. Then after, after Ram Mandir built, it can be a world-class city. So who will decide? The, maybe it is the uh, war of narratives? Thank you. Aapke sawal ka jawab mein ek udharan se deti hoon. Maan lije ki bahut badi ek किसानों की रैली हो रही है उसमें एक ट्रैक्टर रोग हो जाता है और कोई मर जाता है 24/7 चैनल्स न्यूज़ रन कर रहे हैं 24/7 अपलोड हो रही है न्यूज़ डिजिटल मीडिया पर व्हिच आल्सो इंक्लूड्स द द डिजिटल एडिशंस ऑफ डेली न्यूज़पेपर्स नाउ द अपलोडेड न्यूज़ says a boy has died. Half an hour later, the police version comes which is different from it. So the uploaded news is downloaded and the police version is uploaded. <laughs> then half an hour later, another news comes about how this was being done deliberately to spread panic and to create disaffection. So, all that news is taken down. Now that's going to happen more and more in 24-7 when agitations go on for months, when rampages happen, when in the heat of moment people get killed, houses get burnt, bulldozed before the law makes its presence known. So who is to decide? The media's job is, you know, the editor and the whole editorial is screaming at the person on the ground, bhejo bhejo story bhejo, jaldi bhejo, upload karna hai. And the poor guy, if he sends it, he's killed. And he doesn't send it, then he loses his job. 
So this is a very major and a very irritating and also alarming fact of our times that the editorials, be in, because of all this, are depending more and more on agencies. Yeah. Agencies yeah. which the government thinks well of. Yeah. And therefore, agencies also try to keep their news, news uh, catering limited to a certain kind of menu, which further limits what you said, the inflow of news from smaller towns, from smaller provinces, over big issues, take the tunnel collapse in Uttarakhand region. I come from the same area. Do you know the work has begun again because they have said that the collapse of the Himalayas was not due to the tunnel. So, you know, so uh, it really makes you wonder what is happening. I mean, I, I constantly feel I'm living in a kind of a virtual world where truth is untruth and untruth is truth and you know, everything gets mixed up. So partly it's technology, partly it's the hands which manipulate technology, partly it's the ownership pattern, partly, and then in this unholy mix, in comes artificial intelligence. Yeah. So you can imagine what is going to happen. So I think everything has to be rethought from the word go. Sometimes numeric, numerically also, this is the caption has been changed, like some, somewhere, some channels you have seen. So the breaking news is going on, 39 people killed down. In the next channel, 45, 45 killed. In the next channel, channel there's a 30, 30 people has been killed, like that. It differs one to one. Uh, yeah? Guys, we are out of time, but thank you so much for all your questions. You can pro possibly catch the panelists outside and uh, get your answers. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for this engaging discussion uh, to all my panelists.